now we have a, a contribution from, from the OECD. Uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's a substitute teacher. Uh, the expert who uh, were about to join us uh, was unfortunately uh, ill, uh, and uh, the one we uh, identified uh, couldn't manage to, to get a travel in place. So uh, we have to do this on, on, on Skype. And we now invite uh, analyst uh, Liet Zwirn, uh, who will uh, uh, introduce a new point from the OECD. Hello, and thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. I'll be introducing the OECD's International Curriculum Analysis, and I'll be connecting it to the Improving Schools Through International Peer Learning Effort. Can you hear me okay? I hope so. so we'll get going. I'll present, in, I'll present a project, some common challenges that have been identified, and I'll be glad to hear from you regarding your own needs. So the OECD is carrying out an international curriculum analysis. And you may as well say, uh, keep up the good work and good luck to you. But you may think that it's not exactly obvious how this concerns you. And in this case, I would like to ask you if you encountered any of these questions. What values should we include in our curricula? Are the curricula too crowded? Will additional flexibility be beneficial? How can we ensure equity? How do we implement timely curricular change? How can we make a curricular change successful? If you have, then you're not alone. Six common challenges have been identified and defined by the project. Curriculum overload, time lags, values, flexibility and autonomy, quality and equity, and effective implementation. Our activity is aimed at building a knowledge base to serve countries when they're trying to find solutions to these challenges, when they're operating to implement systematic curriculum design process, when they're trying to uh, carry out international peer learning, evidence-based debates, and self-reflection opportunities. Our work is currently a, a work in progress, but we hope to include in our findings some insights, solution approaches, data, and reference to trends and key messages. It's a joint effort. More than 30 countries are participated, as well as personnel from the OECD and outside experts. The analysis is actually composed of three separate activities. The CCM, which concerns itself with curriculum content mapping. The subject-specific analysis, which concentrates on mathematics and physical and health education. And the PQC, which is the policy questionnaire on curriculum design, uh, where I am involved. And the key message I'd like you to take from today's lecture is that countries are facing common challenges across the globe. Our activity is aimed at supporting countries' efforts in finding the solution and in implementing them effectively according to local needs and local goals. I would like to use the uh, issue of curriculum overload as an example. We see today that sometimes students lack time to master key disciplinaries. Beyond that, they sometimes even lack time to engage in more basic activities such as sleep, interaction, and physical activity. We suggest that it's time to shift the focus of our students for more hours of learning to quality learning time. This suggestion is supported by evidence. For example, we can see before us the graph from PISA, which shows the link between PISA science scores and total learning time. And the trend may be opposite to what we may expect. There's a negative connection between the two. We can see countries 
that have relatively few hours of learning with good results regarding PISA science, and on the opposite, countries that invest a lot of time in learning and still have less results in PISA. So the conclusion may be, of course, as a trend and not as an absolute, that more is not always better. When we look at the curriculum overload problem, we may consider several approaches and I'd like to present three. One is the key concept, big ideas. The other is learning passes. And the third is reduction over time. When I'm referring to the key concepts, big idea, this approach takes disciplinary knowledge and divides it into two main components. One is key concepts and big ideas, and the other is detailed content knowledge. The key concepts and big ideas are the big strokes. Those are the major takeaways we would like our students to comprehend and use throughout their lives. And we recommend that even if we're facing the curriculum overload problem, this should be retained. On the other hand, we can look at the detailed content knowledge and try to see if that can be reduced in order to improve the situation. I would like to show you British Columbia's uh, curricula as an example of this. We can see that British Columbia defined four main components for each learning subject. It includes core competencies, big ideas, curricular competencies, and knowledge. For example, on the screen, you can see uh, the subject of social studies for year six. In this subject, four big ideas have been defined. These ideas concern the effect of economic self-interest, the variance in systems of government, complex global problems, and media sources. We can link, as they did, each of the big ideas into certain uh, curriculum content. And we can see here, for example, when we're looking at the Complex global problems require international cooperation to make difficult choices for the future. That is the big idea. The content that might be relevant for this big idea is international cooperation and responses to global issues. Sample topics can be environmental issues, human trafficking, and child labor. In a similar manner, we can also see the big idea concerning media sources that can both positively and negatively affect our understanding of important events and issues. This big idea can be connected to the following content. Media technologies and coverage of current events. Sample topics can be social media uses and abuses, editorial bias, and freedom of the press. So this approach, uh, again, takes disciplinary knowledges and uh, composes it of two main components, the big ideas and uh, key concepts and the key um, and the uh, detailed content. And it offers this approach as a possible solution to the overcrowded curriculum. We can reduce detailed content while still saving the big ideas which we'd like to, our students to retain and understand. Another approach that can be taken is the various learning journeys. So according to this approach, students can choose from, this, from different options to learn across the school years. So for example, in the slide before you, you can see that Singapore has two options for primary school and seven options for secondary school. Each learning path may emphasize different subjects. For example, learning path A can emphasize STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And learning path B can emphasize the arts. This emphasis can 
be reflected in the amount of learning hours devoted to each learning subject. So for example, in learning path A, more learning hours will be given to the STEM subject and less to the others. And in learning path B, more learning hours will be devoted to, art, to arts, but less to the other subject. An additional approach that may be considered is a broad base which focuses over time. According to this approach, we'll give our students a broad base uh, across subjects in early learning years, and we'll reduce the number of subjects being learned as we come into the later school years. For example, you can see before you the national curricula in Australia, which chose to include more than 30 subjects up to the 10th year, and to reduce it by about two-thirds when coming into the senior secondary curriculum. I would like to point out that the reduction is not necessarily linear in fashion. Some subjects, as you can see on the left, can be expanded, some can be reduced or merged. So students will still be exposed to various learning subjects, but less so over time. Another topic that we may wish to concern ourselves with when thinking about curriculum overload is prevalent curricular subject topics. So if you're in a country and you're thinking about reducing curriculum overload, then you might be interested in knowing which subjects are more prevalent across the globe. And when we look across countries, we can see, for example, such subjects in the arts, in humanities and social sciences, in STEM, and also in pupil and or state-oriented subjects. Now, I would like to point out that even if the subjects are prevalent across countries, then the manner in which they are incorporated into the curriculum can change from country to country according to local needs and goals. So for example, one country may choose to have five subjects regarding the arts. The second one may choose to have a, a general subject for humanities and social sciences. Each country will examine its own needs and priorities and decide how to do so, so in order to best serve its own interests. We can see, for example, for Australia, British Columbia, Finland, Scotland, and Singapore, they all have subjects concerning art, drama, and music. They can have different emphasis. So, for example, in Australia, in British Columbia, and in Finland, there's an emphasis regarding visual arts. In Australia, British Columbia, and Finland, they also have, and also in Singapore, they also have multiple subjects regarding the arts. We can see a similar picture regarding social sciences and humanities, and we can also see regarding this subject that English is a very prevalent subject, as well as English, English literature. And we can see how it comes to be in Australia, British Columbia, Finland, Scotland, and Singapore. We can also see a, a reflection of this regarding the STEM subjects. STEM again is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We can see that all all of the three subjects, mathematics, science, and technology, exist across Australia, British Columbia, Finland, Scotland, and Singapore. We can see, for example, that for technology, design is being emphasized in Australia and British Columbia. And we can also see that for Scotland, for example, that has three cross-curricular subjects, we see numeracy with mathematics. Another area of learning is the pupil or state area or state oriented subjects. In this, we can see physical education and or health education across countries. 
We can see career education, and we can also see sign language. Again, we see these certain uh, areas in Australia, British Columbia, Finland, Scotland, and Singapore. I would like to hear, if possible, your opinions, your needs. What do you see when you come to your office every day? There are any volunteers? No. Okay, so I would like to stress yeah. one more point. I'm sorry, yes? Okay. Uh, I'm afraid that we, we uh, consider that uh... Due, due to uh, these uh, technological limitations that we have, uh, that we have considered that an interaction uh, will, will not be, 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 be feasible. But we are, we are still uh, happy to, to, to take your contribution on, on board. And if you will leave uh, our, your, your email address, then uh, individuals can ask you uh, questions uh, for clarification. Uh, but, but it's too, too complex with a limitations that we have to have a direct interaction with the audience, unfortunately. But, but we, we have, okay, we, okay. We are, we are, you're with us anyway. Okay, thank you very much. So I'd like to make one more point, if I may, uh, since we have a little bit more time. In our analysis, we're happy to consider the common core as well as the differences. So countries can take similar approaches and yet adapt them to local needs. One country may uh, prioritize equity, while another may prioritize excellence. So it's interesting for us to see the unique features next to the similarities. And I would like to leave you with the key message of my talk today. Countries are facing common challenges across the globe. And the OECD International Curriculum Analysis is building this knowledge base in order to assist countries in finding good solutions to those common challenges in systematic curriculum design process, in international peer learning, in evidence-based debates, and in self-reflection opportunities. And as you said, we'll be more than happy to receive your comments or questions. You can send them either to the Education 2030 or to my own email. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, your points thank are well you. taken. Uh, and uh, thank you for providing us with this uh, global uh, overview. Uh, I get this uh, inspiration by taking a look at different power outlets in different countries. They look different, and you need different plugs to, to get power from one country to the other. But basically, it's the same thing. Yes. It's all about having energy out. And this, uh, uh, it's uh, striking to see uh, how similar uh, approaches uh, we can identify uh, throughout the uh, uh, countries. Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, and, uh, thank you. Uh, we will uh, meet again uh, during the Education 2030 meeting later this month. Uh, thank, you thank you very you. much. Enjoy the rest of the conference.